Welcome to the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church of Chattanooga. This recording is simply the sermon portion of our worship service. To experience our full worship service, we encourage you and invite you to join us Sunday morning at 11 in our beautiful sanctuary located at 1505 North Moore Road. If I had to choose only one chapter of the Bible to have, uh, Romans 8 would be a pretty good choice to have that single chapter. Every single verse in that chapter is so just packed with meaning and promise and hope. Today's our, cha- our passage is from the 8th chapter of Romans, the 18th verse through the 28th verse. And you have heard these before likely, but see if you can hear them again as if you're hearing them for the first time. Paul tells us, I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see... We wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how we ought to pray, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who is the searcher of hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. My brothers and sisters in Christ, indeed, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This week in our Day Players Chapel and in our Day Players Camp, our character trait for the week has been gratitude. And we've been teaching the kids about gratitude and practicing gratitude. I am so very thankful this morning for this stole that I am wearing. Many of you know that most of the stoles that I have, my wife Lee made for me. And this is a brand new one she made. She used the green uh, for this season of the church year and uh, the plants on there to illustrate growth. And I'm so thankful, and not only that I have so many beautiful, beautiful stoles, but they were made uh, for me by my wife who loves me so much. And I try to offer her uh, the gratitude that she deserves uh, for these souls. She doesn't make them because I demand that she make them for me. She makes them because she loves me. Last week in our sermon, I talked about the fact that when we pray, we ought to make sure that we offer gratitude to God for our very lives and for all of our very, all of the blessings that God has given to us, that praying simply for uh, things that we need is not enough. It's not adequate prayer. And yet this morning scripture lesson reminds us that there are times in our lives when all we have is deep need. It's all that we can focus on or consider, and we have to offer that to God, and that's okay too. Sometimes when I am working with horses, a horse will shift its foot and put its foot on top of my foot. And if you've never experienced a thousand pound animal stepping on your foot, well, don't worry. Don't have the fear of missing out. It's not something you want to experience. Uh, Your entire universe just shrinks down to that little area of your foot that is being stepped on. And if you're like me, you're going to yell out and you're going to be pushing on that horse. And for a few moments, all you can think about is all of that weight on uh, your foot until the horse steps off. That's pretty easily a solvable problem. And usually when the horse steps off, there's no damage and everything is fine. But all of us also have times in our lives where the weight of whatever is pressing down on us is so great 
that it is very hard, if not impossible, to think of anything else. It's very possible to, to have any sense of, of gratitude because all we can feel is that weight. If you're suffering from a, a very serious disease or the loss of a relationship or the grief of someone who has died whom you love very much, for a while the weight that just presses down is all that you can consider. And maybe the best prayer that you can offer simply is, Oh God! Uh, because the pain is so great. Well, Paul tells us that not only we, but all of creation is groaning to be released from the weight of sin, the weight of death, the weight of the decay that sin brings into the world. And maybe it is the case that even in those times when we are facing such difficult times, we ought to be able to pray, pray prayers of gratitude. But Paul says there are some times when we cannot pray as we ought. All we can pray is a primal scream or a groan. And we might wonder, well, what would God think if all we can pray is a prayer of great need when God has given to us so much? And Paul answers that for us. He says that God doesn't judge us. God doesn't criticize us for that. God, God doesn't punish us for that. But instead, he says, when we don't know how to pray as we ought, the Holy Spirit intercedes, prays for us. And the prayers that the Holy Spirit makes are groans that are groans even beneath words. Part of what I hear there is the Holy Spirit is also groaning for us. This wasn't my intention for you. God did not intend for death and pain and sin to be a part of the world. And so the Holy Spirit is groaning for us because it didn't have to be that way. And the Holy Spirit understands us and cares for us and loves us. Paul says that God is the searcher of hearts. In many translations it says God who searches hearts, but it actually Paul is giving God that title. God is the searcher of hearts. And when God searches our hearts during those terribly dark times, what does God find? God finds the Holy Spirit. God finds the Spirit of Christ in our hearts interceding for us. That word searcher, searcher of hearts, uh, comes essentially from the idea of someone who lights a candle or lights an oil lamp and takes it into a very dark place and is searching around in that very dark place. In 1922, Howard Carter discovered a tomb that he thought might be the tomb of the boy king Tutankhamun. And he uh, cabled to his benefactor, Lord Canaveral, saying, I think that I have found uh, the tomb. And Canaveral was text back, or not, not text back, uh, cabled back and said, wait until I can get there. I want to be there when you open the tomb. And so Howard Carter had to wait 19 or 20 days for Canaveral to make his way to Egypt, uh, to make his way to the tomb. And the day came and, and they cut a little window into the, the wall of the tomb. And uh, a Carter was able to take a candle and stick it in there and kind of stick his head in there to look around. And Canaveral right behind him says to Carter, what do you see? What do you see? And all that Howard Carter can say is wonderful things. In those terribly dark times in our lives, when pain and death and decay are, are all around us and darkness seems to have completely enveloped us, God, the searcher of hearts, comes to us with that candle. And when God looks into our hearts, and that is a little terrifying. I, in some ways, I wouldn't want God to look into my heart. But when God looks into our heart, God would say, what do you see? I see wonderful things. I see the Spirit of Christ in there. And the Spirit of Christ understands. One of the wonderful things about our faith is that Jesus indeed, indeed did come in the flesh. Jesus came to be one of us. As Hebrews said, he was tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. Jesus understands. He understands what it is to laugh and to love, but he also understands what it is to hurt and to grieve. And when God searches our hearts, God is saying to us, I understand. And the groans that God makes are groans for us. And yet God does not leave us merely with understanding, but God has the power to do something for us. 
during the depths of the Civil War when things were darkest and the outcome was absolutely not assured, a friend of Abraham Lincoln's from Kentucky came to the White House to visit him. And they talked for a while and they talked about how poorly the war was going, how uncertain the future was. And as Lincoln's friend began to get ready to go, he said, uh, Sir, what cheering thing can you tell me that I can take back to our other friends in Kentucky? And Abraham Lincoln, that wonderful storyteller, said, Well, I heard the other day about a chess-playing automaton about a machine that can play chess. And this man that, that owned and invented this machine, he was taking it from town to town, and he would invite a chess master or a great chess player in that town to come and play, and they would sell tickets, and he was making a lot of money uh, having this chess-playing um, automaton beating all of these chess masters. And he went to a particular town and he invited a, a chess master to come. And the, the man came and played. And in three matches, in all three matches, the chess playing automaton beat the man. And when that third match was over, the man stood up and he began walking around that very large machine, studying it very, very carefully. And finally, after he walked around it several times, he pointed at it and he said, there is a man in there. Lincoln said, when you go back to Kentucky, tell them there is a man in here, a man in the White House. Lincoln was saying, as long as I am president, I am going to be working to save the Union. I'm going to be working to free the slaves. There is a man at work for the good of our country in here in the White House. When God searches our hearts, God hears and sees the Holy Spirit groaning with groans uh, too deep even for words. And God sees that man in here, Jesus Christ, in our hearts. And that man in there is always working for our good. And that's why this passage ends with all things work together for good those who love the Lord and, and are called according to His purpose. Now notice it doesn't say all things work together for the best. It doesn't say that all things work together in the ways that we might want them to work together. But what we are promised is that because Jesus not only understands us, but also has died for us and been raised for the dead, uh, from the dead for us, death is really no longer in play. As Jesus said to uh, Martha at the tomb of her, her brother Lazarus, that yet though someone die, he shall, still shall live because of me. Death is off of the board. All things work together for good. That's why Paul also can say, that considering the, what is coming in the future age, the, the, the future glory doesn't even hold a candle to our present sufferings. And so as we consider this passage this day, let us notice two things. First, we are never alone. Our very groans of pain yelling out, Oh God, are in fact evidence that we are children of God and that God hears us and is, and is with us and is groaning along with us, suffering with us. And second, that death never gets the last word. The Spirit of Christ is in us because Jesus is alive. Death could not hold Him and death cannot hold us. We in creation groan because we know that God is not finished with us, neither us nor creation. We in creation groan because we know that this is not all there is, but we also know this present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that is to come. And that God is working to bring good even out of the most disastrous events in our lives. And that can be enough. Perhaps just enough. But that can be enough to get us to the next moment, to the next day, to eternal life. So thanks be to God who does not ask us to move forward in our own strength, but who is with us in our weakness, who hears our cry and offers his own on our behalf, and who ultimately has plans to free us and all of creation from pain and despair and death. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for this message from the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Once more, we hope you'll join us in person Sunday at 11 a.m. for worship.